put my full time efforts into this without a salary until a profit can be realized. Mm -hmm. okay. Other questions? Yeah. Go ahead, Steve. On Palmetto uh, Ale, mm -hmm. the numbers were unbelievably low to me when I looked at that because I've heard of them, I drank yeah. it. Correct. Right. How can that be? I mean, what, what did they do? The numbers that I based those off of were their 2010 um, reports that they have to make to the alcohol, uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms division on the amount of alcohol they produce for taxation purposes. Whether or not they had other agreements in place or made other money through other sales outside of their alcohol production, I do not know. But these are based on federal reporting of their alcohol production. Why haven't they been more successful then? I mean, if they they, ha they build themselves out as a five to seven barrel brewing system. We're looking at starting off as a 30 barrel brewing system. They've started as a small local brewery. We're looking at building ourselves out as a regional brewery to make those things happen. Okay, go ahead, Don. In your business plan, I, how, come you're, how come white labeling isn't a big part of that plan? White labeling actually is a decent portion of that plan. However, the profit margins on white labeling, such as we have already developed a relationship with um, uh, a brewery out of Metro DC that's not even a brewery. It is a beer company that has contract brewing done, hence white labeling. And when you're looking at the profit margin on doing contract brewing for other beer companies, you're looking at a 5% margin at best. Whereas when you do Direct sales, you're looking at 37%. And even when you do distributed sales, you're looking at 12.5% of selling to a distributor as far as profit margin. Therefore, if we can do more selling to distributors or direct sales, it's a much smaller percentage to actually take the time to do the distribute the white label sales. Right. That's my problem yeah. with this, and I, I don't drink, so I can look at this objectively. I'm thinking of a place in Milton Head, and they have 200 craft beers in Yes. And it's I wonder how you don't get lost in that shop. Um, because of the fact that, number one, we will be marketing directly not only to the public in the area that comes into the area, uh, marketing at the Savannah Airport, mar marketing as they go into Hillnet, but we'll also be doing bartender education as well as bar owner education at each of the bars in our geographical regional area. And just, we were at Hilton Head the last three days. We came back to Savannah yesterday. Um, and just in speaking to the bartenders and the bar managers, they told us directly, and we've heard this many times throughout Chatham County as well as coastal Georgia, if there's a local alternative, people are asking, what is the local beer? And they're having to say, well, we have Anderson out of Columbia, South Carolina, or Sweetwater out of Atlanta, or Palmetto out of North Charleston. If there was something that were within 20 or 30 miles that they could claim with their beer, they would be pushing it. We've even been told, and this is a really weird statement, it could be the worst beer ever. But if you're selling it, if you're producing it here in Savannah, and you're selling it here in Savannah, you'll sell a bus. Huh? To what extent will you use contract brewing and startup, and how much capital will it cost you to, uh, to build a brewery to satisfy the next five years of demand? Um, great question, and the actual fact is we do not want to contract brew other than what we're doing for taste groups and to verify that a proof of concept. Just due to the fact that the Georgia laws are so weird on using contract brewing and distributing, if you contract brew in the state of Georgia, you're almost considered a distributor. And if you're producing over a certain limit and then selling to distributors, you're considered a distributor yourself, have to cease operations for a certain amount of time before you can begin production of your own beer, before you get the dual system that is outlawed in the state of Georgia. Um, additionally, um, we're really looking at the fact that we want to produce our own beer. We want to prove that it's made here. We don't want to be somebody else who is buying beer from somewhere else, repackaging it, and selling it in the local area. Um, and we're really looking at just using it for focus groups, for the concept, as well as, as marketing. And the second part of the question again? How much capital to build the brewery? That's a great question. Um, we are asking for $2.438 million, which for a manufacturing firm is nothing. 
most of the time you can't get into manufacturing space for less than $10 million. However, we do have the $2.438 million plan, we have the $1.5 million plan, we have the $1 million plan because we're realists. If we were to ask for $2.5 million, we might be lucky and get $1.25. We have the contingency plans. To be the short answer, we have a plan that is $800,000 that we could actually get off the ground and start manufacturing beer and shipping it out the door. But we're not going to start with trying to fundraise at that point. I have a question. I'm yes, not sir. a beer drinker, but sorry, I went to University of Wisconsin, so I know about beer. Then you should. <laughs> uh, you kind of belittle the efforts of Miller, Budweiser, whatever, with all their advertising might and dollars. How come there is a craft brewing industry? And could you give me the definition of craft brewing? I would love to give you a definition of craft brewing, but let me first address the first part of it. And I don't mean to belittle Budweiser, Coors, Miller, or anything else. Um, if you look back at 1929, Prohibition. It wasn't you. Neither was I. Um, but if you look back at it, um, there were more breweries than there are today, including craft breweries. Including what? Including craft breweries. There were more breweries in the United States than there are today. We were following, the, as a country, we were following the European model, which each individual town, each individual region had their own individual distinct craft breweries, or breweries, not even craft breweries. Um, when Prohibition came about, only a few survived. Yinling, the oldest brewery in the United States, shifted over to making root beer during Prohibition. That's how they survived. Once Prohibition was repealed and you know you were able to make beer again, Yinling and a few others went back to making beer. A few others sprang up. And since then, there has been a slow growth to make it back. The U.S. is finally mirroring the European growth of breweries in the last 200 years. We only happen to be about 80 years behind Europe because of the cessation due to prohibition. And the future is bright here. I don't mean to belittle Anheuser-Busch or anyone else. They're great companies. However, they got used to the fact that they were the only business on the block. And once you get complacent, once you stop trying to innovate, once you're only competing with your brother, and there have been many taste tests, blind taste tests, between Miller Lite, Bud Lite, Coors Lite, in which you cannot tell the difference between the three. To remember his uh, menu of different beers, the variation of taste and which of the residual grains basically dominates become the difference. And there's just multitudinous numbers of, of formulations you can make. So it's finding tastes that are different than the standard taste, which the big brewers make, because they make it in such quantity, they have to standardize it. If it doesn't all taste the same, you wouldn't be buying it. But this gives you the variation, and that's that's where you build your little niche markets. Asheville is uh, an interesting place in North Carolina. They are soon to have 11 craft breweries uh, there in Asheville. Two majors, uh, Sam Adams is coming in, and one other is going to start up operations there with others. Uh, two others, yes, okay. correct. Uh, to basically operate there because, it's, of course, it's a great market. Uh, second, it, it appreciates the variation of craft beer. Joe, last question, then we're going to take our break. Why'd you bring a bottle of there? He thought he was here at Fast Pitch and they would have been not allow any sampling. Oh, uh, there it is. He's got it. He's, he wants <laughs> to. So I'm really feeling uncomfortable up here without a bottle in my hand. He said if we invite him back, he'll bring plenty. <laughs> yes, will. Okay, let's take our, let's take our, Jody, have a yeah, other question. Oh, yeah, a real question. These large beer companies, ones that you mentioned, actually uh, have special beers and distributors that squeeze out some of the smaller beers. They do, they do. That's why we're talking about in our um, 
our target markets, that being Hilton Head, the Low Country, South Carolina coast, and Georgia and North Florida, dealing with the small independents that don't deal with the larger ones. And as I said, but if you went to a bar directly and you try to get your beer on the shelf, wouldn't their distributor then say, well, hey, I'm sorry, we're not selling you Budweiser anymore? But no, they won't. They won't. There's absolutely not that type of relationship. Uh, it's actually illegal for them to try to do that. What they can try and do is pressure those retailers into not caring by saying, hey, well, because you such a great deal on these 20 others. However, in Savannah, and I'm from Savannah, I don't know how many other people are from Savannah. It's always been and always will be, and I have to say this, and it's just a fact, there's always been the, the I scratch your back, you, you scratch mine, I know who you are type mentality. We've dealt with investors, and we're dealing with investors currently out of Atlanta who went to deal in Savannah before because the people they were trying to deal with weren't locals. My mother, a few of you may know her. Uh, my grandmother, a few of you may know her. I am third generation Savannah. I grew up here, went to school here, graduated high school here, joined the military and was over at Paris Island. I'm one of those guys. That when I come back, people actually, when they hear my last name, go, isn't your mom? And it's the truth, it is. And I hate to say that the the whole Buddy Buddy Network is truly alive in Savannah, but it, it surely is. So can you compete any other way besides that whole local cachet thing? Can you compete on Savannah? Maybe? Oh, oh, we can we can be there on price, but we are dealing with Sam Adams who produces over two million barrels of craft beer a year, and they've had the federal government and the craft beer industry change their definition of craft brewery because before anything that produced over 1.8 million barrels of beer a year could not be considered a craft beer. To suddenly accept 2.2 million as being a craft beer, uh, you can't deal with that. They're producing too fast, but. There is a local desire here. What's made local? What is the local beer? What is the local product? What's creating jobs right here in the local area? 